welcome to the first English language interview in the series A Man's Mission for Tibet from London Ne. So far there have been six Tibetan language interviews in this series, interviewing Tibetans and their contribution to the Tibetan struggle. So for the first interview in English, I'd like to introduce John Billington. Uh, first of all, thank you for accepting the invitation from London Ne to do this interview. Um, John is a long-standing supporter of Tibet. John is the former chairman of Tibet Society and has a long-term involvement in Tibet ever since the 1950s. So John will tell us about his time in India, about his encounter with Tibetans, and then later on his work and support for Tibet until the, pres until the present day. So um, I think we'll just start by asking Can I just John, say thank you very yes. much, Dieter and La, for inviting me. And You're I feel very, very privileged to be the first of your English language speakers. You're very welcome. Thank you again. So maybe we can start if you can just sure. tell us a little bit about your family background and your upbringing before you started. Uh, very briefly, with India and my family came from the west of Ireland. Um, they left because of the activity of the IRA in the 1930s. Uh, my father was a farmer for a while. Um, and I, got, I was brought up in the countryside in the UK. I had a very simple education. I went to a village school, then I went to a grammar school. But eventually I was quite clever, so I got to university, I got to Oxford. And um, at, from the age of 16, I became very interested in Buddhism. I can elaborate on that if you want me to. Do you want me yes, to? Yes, please, please yeah. go ahead. Well, yes. when I was 16, I was actually at a boarding school. And in 1951, Christmas Humphreys wrote an important book on Buddhism, which was published in Pelican. And in those days, all young people educated themselves by reading Pelican books, because, you know, there was no television. So I read this book on Buddhism, and the chapter on Tibetan Buddhism especially interested me. And at the age of 16, I first had the idea that I would write to the Dalai Lama because we were of a similar age. And I, I could picture him studying in Tibet while I was studying in the school in St. Albans. I didn't write because I had no faith that the postal system between England and Tibet would work. <laughs> um, so I didn't write. But, I mean, that was the first time I thought of I would like to meet him. After that, um, this was 1952, I, um, I became deeply interested in Tibet and um, I read quite a lot about Tibetan Buddhism. I read, of course, uh, Fosco Moraini's Secret Tibet. I read, uh, in 1953, Heinrich Harris' Seven Years in Tibet came out. And unusually, an old boy of the school where I was learning, he had studied Tibetan. Where had he studied Tibetan? Uh, I, 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 I do not know, because I, at the time I was too young to even ask him. He was lecturing. <laughs> right. But I think it must have been Soas. Oh, he was a very early mm -hmm. student of Tibetan. And as far as I know, he didn't do anything with it. But I was just impressed by the fact that an old boy of the school was learning Tibetan. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, um, after that I went to university in Oxford and I was reading... Uh, English literature, because I wanted to teach, I knew that, but I spent quite a lot of my time reading about Hinduism and Buddhism and um, studying things in the Oriental Department in the Oxford University. Then I took my degree in 1958 and eight days later I was out in Bombay. I'd already taken a job uh, in Bombay because I wanted to see at first hand, you know, what religion in India was like. That was quite an adventure in those <laughs> days. Well, that leads me nicely into the second question because I was going to ask you how yeah. it was that you came to travel to India. So well, it's from your reading yeah. and then what was it like to be in a place, because I can assume that until that time you'd only really been in England. Mm, that's right. Yeah, I so hadn't travelled at all. Yeah, you know, so in the 1950s, people didn't travel much. There was no cheap air flights. Um, to go to India was three weeks on a ship. Um, the only way I could go to India was to take a job there. 
Right. Uh, I, you know, I hadn't got any private money. I, I had to work. So I, when I was at university, I looked for a job in India. And there were two. One was at Gwalior, and the other was at the Cathedral School, Bombay. I decided to take the one in Bombay in the end. So I went to Bombay, as it was then called, and um, one year later, 1959, I started, I picked up a copy of Charles Bell's Grammar of Colloquial Tibetan, and I started learning the language. And also in 1959, critical year, I made my first trip to Darjeeling. And I was very impressed because Darjeeling was an exciting place to be. It was high up in the Himalayas. The Tibetan resistance movement, the fighters were coming over. They had their horses with them. They had their swords. They were dressed in their chubbas. And, you know, some of them had just come across the border from Tibet where they had been resisting the Chinese. I didn't know much about the politics at the time, but obviously I was I was very interested in the situation and when I went back to Bombay I made up my mind that when my contract in Bombay was finished, which it was in 1961, I would then go to Darjeeling and teach there so that I could be in closer contact with the Tibetans. So that's really how I came to be there. I'm, I should just say before I finish that India was a very welcoming country for me and it did not disappoint me in any way. It, it, it is a country which is, has a very strong religious background and I was impressed by the fact that you could go into a restaurant or a cafe in Bombay or any town in India and have a conversation on quite serious matters very easily, mm. which is something you can't do in Europe. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so when you decided to go to India was it in the back of your mind somehow that you would encounter Tibetans as well? Was that sort of your aim to be close to Tibet? Because Bombay is very far from Darjeeling. Not, I don't think it was um, initially. I mean, I suppose my interest was initially in India, though I knew, of course, that Tibet was very close. Um, but I was interested in Hinduism as well as Buddhism, and I knew there was a lot to explore. My family had no contacts with India, but, you know, it is an enormously interesting place to be. It's such an ancient civilization, and there was so much of interest, particularly in the religion, you know, in Jainism, Sikhism, Hinduism, Buddhism, uh, and Islam. I mean, they're all in India. Um, so it was a fascinating place. Was it still quite British at the time? I mean, in the 50s? No, I, I wouldn't say it was British, mm. but I mean, it was only 11 years after independence, so, and, most of the British people had gone by then, so people like myself who were coming out were actually quite few, very few. Uh, so one was, um, you know, they were quite happy to see one or two people coming to work voluntarily. Um, and it was, it was, I found it a friendly place mm -hmm. and I enjoyed teaching very much. I mean, mm -hmm. lovely people. Mm -hmm. and so did you experience a lot of culture shock just in practical terms? <laughs> I am not easily shocked. <laughs> I can remember the night I arrived. I arrived in the middle of the monsoon. Just after I'd taken my degree, I, it would be July or August. It was pouring with rain. You know what the monsoon is like. And I arrived at night. So going through the streets of Bombay in the darkness, in pouring rain, with a lot of people, of course, in those days, they wore dhotis. You know, they were dressed in white and so forth. It was... It was, it was interesting. <laughs> Big change. <laughs> but I, I, I'm quite a courageous person. I'm not yes. easily put off. Yes. <laughs> so um, if I can ask you a bit more about your time in Darjeeling, you yeah. said you saw the resistance fighters coming yeah. from Tibet. Yeah. What was the situation like for Tibetans at that time? It was such a critical time, as you mentioned. Yes, it was. Um, again, I didn't really know much about the politics at the time, but uh, <clears throat> I went to this St. Paul's school in Darjeeling and uh, I very quickly made the acquaintance of the Tibetan Refugee School, which was run by Hlawang Pulja. And I've got a photograph of him taken fairly recently, oh. shortly before he died. Right. But I knew Hlawang Pulja. Of course, I got to know Tsewa Yishi Pemba. And I got to know, of course, Northern and Nuzin Pemba and all the Pemba family. And I spent 
as much of my spare time as I could down at the refugee school, doing a little bit of sort of amateur teaching of English there, which they welcomed. There were very few, very few European in Darjeeling mm. at that time. They'd mostly all gone. There were a few tea planters. Um, the tea planters were not the least bit interested in Tibet. I mean, they'd got their own problems down in the tea gardens. Um, there was one ex-army bloke who was there, but I didn't get to know him. Um, apart from that, there were one or two teachers um, at St. Joseph's or at St. Paul's. That was really it. Um, I spent most of my spare time, as I say, um, socialising with the Tibetan community, who were the ones that really interested me. I mean, they're the ones I, I came to, I wanted to get to know. Um, and, of course, I, I, I did understand that um, there had been an uprising in Lhasa in 1959. This was now three years ago, because I'm, we're now talking about 1962. Um, but, I mean, the resistance was still going on. Um, there were a lot of refugees coming over the border, and in a minute, if you want, I can show you a photograph of mm -hmm. one or two of them. Yes. Um, and they would end up in the market in Darjeeling selling things because they were short of money. And they were selling chubbas and swords and, you know, all sorts of things. Mm. Um, yeah. So did you hear stories from them about the resistance and about the fighting? Not so much, really. Mm. Uh, they weren't... Um, a, my, 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 my um, ability to converse in Tibetan was very limited, mm. um, and they didn't speak English. Mm. So, you know, communication was quite difficult. Mm. It was um, uh, on very simple matters. Yes. I didn't get to understand much of the politics, mm. except through your uncle, Zewan mm -hmm. Yishi, yes. and Norden and Nuzin. Mm. I mean, they sort of kept mm. me a bit more informed. Right. Um, I spent a lot of my time at the monasteries because mm. I was interested in the religion. Yes. And that was sort of all the monasteries in Darjeeling area, Sikkim area. I knew the lot, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So what was the atmosphere like? Did you feel a sense of urgency from, well, well you know, with the situation with Tibetan refugees coming in? No. What was it like? No. Actually, you didn't get that sense of urgency. Um, the mood at the time was surprisingly optimistic. Hmm. Um, I as I said, uh, a, a lot of the Tibetans still, at that time, believed that the Chinese could be um, halted, that, they could, you know, that, that maybe they would get help from America or the international community. Um, and I think they had not given up. You know, they were still quite determined. Um, it's interesting, I don't know at what point they gave up. I mean, after all, if you think about it, the um, the uh, Jushi Chung, Chung, Jushi Kung Duk, Kung Duk Jushi Kung Duk, yes. was carrying on and continued, I think, till 1974, I think, wasn't it? Or 72, I forget which, but, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. they were carrying on resistance from Mustang in Nepal yes. till quite late. Yes. So, you know, that sort of resistance was going on. Mm. So in the 1960s, early 60s, um, they were still fairly optimistic, I think. Yeah. Mm, that's so interesting. Yeah. They were certainly, I didn't get any sense of despair. Mm. Um, obviously, I, I mentioned in the uh, article I wrote for the um, Foundation newsletter that um, Gombo Tashi uh, Andoksan, who was a great Kamba leader, yes. um, he was treated at the hospital by your uncle. Yes. And uh, I was there, of course, when he died. And of course, that was a matter of a great grief because he was such an important and heroic figure of the resistance, um, which is why I joined in the funeral procession, because, like, you know, it was to celebrate a very important hero. I was aware of that, that that was a sort of quite a sad blow for the Tibetan resistance, you know. Yes. Um, uh, the next really sad blow after that was really um, when the Nepalese government disarmed the uh, resistance fighters who were in Mustang. That was the real, that was the sort of end yeah. of the resistance yeah. then, really. Right, yeah. yes. So, um, in Darjeeling, what was your sort of everyday life like? Did you assimilate quite well into... Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> oh, I loved it. <laughs> you loved oh, it. I loved it. I, I, yes. I could have stayed there for a long time. Mm. The reason I, I didn't stay because the Indian government at the time was 
did not like what they thought of as neo-colonialism. That is to say, European people still doing jobs. They thought any job done by a European could be done by an Indian. Well, not, fair enough. I see. And before I left, in the mid-1960s, they were beginning to replace the European, the British tea planters, with Indian tea planters. Now, I knew then that the same was going to happen with teachers. I mean, there were very few British teachers in it, just a handful of, but they were being replaced by Indians. Instead of having a British headmaster, the next one would be an Indian headmaster, and so forth. So I could see that there was no future there, that, you know, I had to get back to the UK and get recognised there. So um, otherwise, in terms of enjoyment, I could have stayed there a long time. <laughs> So you stayed in India from Bombay to Darjeeling, you must have been there... Seven years. Seven years. 50, uh, 58 to 65, mm -hmm. yeah. A, wow. bit short of, a bit short of seven years. Wow, that's a very long time. It is quite a long time, yes. but I, I had a leave in between. I went back to the UK for six months mm -hmm. and came out again. Oh, I see. So that was okay. Yes. Um, but I, um, I made a lot of good friends among the Tibetan community, chiefly with your family, mm -hmm. yes. of course. Yeah, of course. But with yes. other people as well, mm -hmm. you know. That's great. Um, yeah. And I learned a lot. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and you, did, you, did you study Tibetan? At yes, that time? I did. Yeah. I am not very quick at learning the language, but I mean, I did learn to write it. I can write mm -hmm. it, ah, and okay. I can read the script. Yes. Um, yes. But I am not fluent. Even now, I, I'm I'm lousy, really. I'm bad. <laughs> but I, you know, I try um, to speak a bit. Did you study Buddhism in a formal, in a, any kind of no. formal way? No, I did not. Mm. No, I did mm. not. Um, I, I, I. I'm a great believer in a sense in that you must teach yourself, you know, look within, thou art Buddha, you know, in other words, the guru is inside you. Um, and I didn't go in for, um, this came a little bit later, it came with the Beatles, you know, oh, when, when the Beatles came along in the sort of mm -hmm. mid-1960s or thereafter, whenever it was, after I'd gone back to the UK, then this was the time of the guru, you know, Mahesh, Maharishi, Yogi, and you know, all these people were having yes. gurus, you know. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't that was go, after you. <laughs> I, that was after me. Yes. And I, I didn't go in mm -hmm. for that. I felt really, you know, you should be able to learn this and understand yourself, really. Mm. Um, I don't know whether that's right or wrong, mm. but that's my decision. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, so um, I'd like to ask you about your meetings with His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. You mentioned that you thought of writing to him when you were yes. 16 years old. Yes. But you didn't actually meet him till no. quite a bit later. I didn't so. meet till the 19, I would say sometime in the 1970s, I think. I cannot actually now remember when it was, but it was one of his early visits to mm. the UK. Maybe 73? It might have been 73. Yes. What had happened, I, or it may have been later than that, because, um, it was in 1978 that the BBC ran a programme by Felix Green, which was pure propaganda on sort of how wonderful life in Tibet was, thanks to the Chinese who had made everything wonderful and Tibetans were happy and wearing all their sort of best clothes and so forth. It was a propaganda film. And um, I knew this was rubbish. I knew this was a long way from the truth. Yes. And um, I wrote a letter to the uh, Daily Telegraph, which was a serious newspaper in those days, and uh, they published it at great length, a huge length, about 20 column inches, uh, of my objections to this film, pointing out the inaccuracies and pointing out um, that Tibet had been an independent country and had been invaded, and the religion and the human rights of the people had been uh, hugely damaged. Um, now, at the time, people in the West knew really nothing at all about Tibet. I mean, a few people had read Heinrich Harris' Seven Years in Tibet, and apart from that, you know, no one knew anything since. Mm, yes. Now, Heinrich Harris' book came out in 1953. So between 1953 and 1978, that's 25 years, there was no news of Tibet. None at all. No one knew what was happening inside Tibet. So I wrote... Um, as I say, my letter drew me to the attention of the Tibet Society, which did exist, yes. but I didn't know about it. Mm. Um, and 
someone from the Tibet Society arranged for me to meet His Holiness, and it was oh, all thanks to the fact that I had written so forcefully in oh, my letter so supporting. You didn't meet him until after 1978. It was. It may have been. Um, it must have been after 1978. Oh, I see. It must have been after 78 because mm -hmm. it was after that. Yes. Oh, I yes. see. I yes. think that's right. I'm. That's my memory. Did you tell him that you wanted to write to him? When you were 16? I, no, I didn't, yeah. actually. <laughs> <laughs> you could have been pen pals. I don't think I did think of that, mm -hmm. shall I? <laughs> so how was, uh, how was your meeting with His Holiness and your well, subsequent sort of meetings? I mean, I have met him mm -hmm. quite a lot. And, um, of course, it is a great privilege. I, I consider myself immensely lucky to have met him. You know, I am very lucky. It is a great privilege to, to meet him. Um, the longest meeting I had with him was about an hour and 40 minutes. Yes. And this was after I had made my first visit to Tibet. I see, yes. Which I did in 1988, yes. after Tibet became, opened up a bit. Yes. And I spent three months in Tibet. Yes. And I came back to India, uh, to uh, Kathmandu, and then to Dharamsala. And I arranged to meet His Holiness. And because I had quite a lot of information. He questioned me at great length, so I had a very long interview with him. Mm. At that time I had a tape recorder and I was hoping to record the interview. And after the interview, His Holiness sent a message to my hotel and asked if he could have the tape. Oh. <laughs> and I had to admit that my tape recorder hadn't worked. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that important interview mm -hmm. yes failed to record because we didn't have someone like Palana mm -hmm. doing the recording. Yes. <laughs> so I was an amateur. Un undocumented. <laughs> undocumented, <laughs> unfortunately, because I mean, recorded. it was a very good interview and I'm I think sure. he wanted a record of it. Yes, yes. Oh, we, that's a we, shame. We hadn't got it. That's a shame. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. you have to rely on your memory yes. for that one. Um, you were involved somewhat uh, in his nomination for the Nobel Peace Prize. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about well, that? Well, as far as I know, now I don't want to, I don't want to claim credit unless it's due, and I don't know, but as far as I know, I was the person who proposed his illness first, who had the idea. Which, which year was that? 1983. Today. Now this is recorded in, if you look at the minutes of the Tibet Society, I've always been a person with ideas, you know, I, I, I sort of tend to think of things to do. And the, I had been a member of the Tibet Society for some years, and at some point it occurred to me, why don't we put forward His Holiness for the Peace Prize? So I went to a meeting. I, came, I was teaching in Derbyshire. I came down by train to this meeting. The president of the Tibet Society was Lord Ennels. Now, Lord Ennels was an excellent bloke. He was a great supporter of the Tibetan cause. And I said at this meeting, you know, why don't we put forward His Holiness for the Nobel Peace Prize? Now, that suggestion was met, I remember it, it was met with astonishment. No one seems to have thought of it, you know. I said, well, why not? Um, why don't we put him forward, you know? It would be a great thing if we could get him the Nobel Peace Prize and it would raise the issue of Tibet. Lord Ennels, who was president, thought it a good idea and he said, Right, John, he said, you, will you write to the Nobel Peace Prize Committee and find out how we go about it? Which I did. I, I found out, I forget where I found out, but I found out the address of the Nobel Peace Prize Committee in uh, Oslo, I think it was. I wrote to them and I got a reply. I've actually got it with me, or oh, I've got, I've got some of it with me. Um, and they explained to me, I said... I want to nominate a person with the 1984 Nobel Peace Prize. Oh, I, I actually, I remember the date. I said yes. 1984, because I thought you could do it quickly. <laughs> and they wrote back and told me how it could be done. They sent me a little pamphlet showing. And basically, MPs, university lecturers, senior lawyers, you know, judges, you know, people high up in their professions are the people who can mm. put someone. So subsequently, I came to another Tibet Society meeting. I explained this and I passed it on. I then passed it over to Lord Ennels because he was in London and he was also in the House of Lords. And he could do things 
I couldn't possibly do. I was a full-time teacher and I'm up in Derbyshire. So I handed it over to him. And really, Lord Ennels, and he also, uh, with the help of Ricky Hyde Chambers, because Ricky Hyde Chambers had contact with the MPs. So Lord Ennels and Ricky Hyde Chambers took it over. But they do take some credit for having put forward the idea. Yeah, that was their idea. <laughs> That's incredible. And actually, I yes. was invited mm -hmm. to the ceremony mm -hmm. in Oslo when His Holiness received the Nobel Peace Prize. But I didn't go, partly because I was busy teaching. And it is not easy to take time off for a thing like that. And it was quite expensive. So I didn't actually go. Mm -hmm. But I could have gone. I had an mm -hmm. invitation. Well, yes. so your idea, it, it took six years. Yes, I'm quite, to, I'm quite yeah. pleased. It took six yes, years, six but years. eventually it happened. Yeah, no, and obviously that was a... Whether anyone else in some other part of the world had the same idea, I don't know. Maybe All we'll I can find say out is, as far as the UK is concerned, as far yes. as I know, I, it was me who definitely. put forward the idea. Yeah, and that was definitely a very significant, <laughs> significant milestone. I would like to think I'd helped. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, so can you tell us a little bit more about your involvement with Tibet support groups? You mentioned the Tibet Society, you were the chair. Yes. Can you tell us about sort of the work you've done with It's quite hard groups? to explain, really, but mm. I mean, I certainly was quite politically, in, political in my thinking. I mean, I do feel that like Tibetan culture and civilization is actually quite a great civilization. I mean, you know, if you look at the United Nations, there are approximately, I don't know what it is now, about 160, 180 uh, members. In terms of value internationally, culturally, I would put Tibet in the top quarter. You know, well, it's great. a very important yes. culture and yes. civilization. It's unique. Yes. There is no other culture like it anywhere. It's different from anywhere else. And Tibetan Buddhism is itself unique. Tibetan architecture runs for, you know, well over a thousand miles to east and west. And so Tibetan culture strikes me as being extremely valuable. And because it's valuable, we mustn't allow another culture, which is another great culture, of course, the Chinese, also a very powerful culture, and of course, numerically, much more densely populated, yes. but we mustn't allow the one to destroy the other. So I felt very strongly about this, that, you know, Tibetan culture is worth defending and worth supporting, and a great injustice has been done to the Tibetan people. That is my starting point. And that, I think, is something His Holiness also feels, that, you know, it is actually, in the end, it's a matter of justice. The Tibetans have been treated very unjustly. It is therefore, I think, um, important that free nations like the British and the Americans and everyone else in the world, Europe, the whole of Europe and so forth, African countries, countries which are free and have recently become free from colonial rule, should support Tibet because actually the situation in Tibet is colonial. It is actually, they are a colony of a superior force which has conquered them by military force. Yes. So it is a colonial situation. We must not lose sight of that. It's a colony. Um, and it's ruled by military force. And I feel, I know the Chinese view it differently. They think, you know, it's an internal matter. It isn't an internal matter. It's an international matter. So I felt very strongly politically, and I still do. Um, and during the years from 1978, um, when I first sort of, you know, made some resistance to the propaganda that was going on, until the early 1990s, I did write letters regularly to the newspapers supporting Tibet. I had any opportunity. You know, whenever the Dalai Lama visited, I would write a letter about what was going on in Tibet. Now, why has it changed? The fact of the matter is that it is much more difficult now to support Tibet than it was from that period, 1970, let's say, to the early 1990s, it has become much more difficult. The, the reasons are complex. Do you want me to explain? Mm -hmm. yeah, please I'll go do ahead. my best to yeah. explain, in my opinion, mm -hmm. what has happened. Yes. I think in 1985, His Holiness changed from seeking um, a plebiscite for Tibetans 
whereby they might express their wish for independence, he changed to seeking what later became called a middle way approach of autonomy within China. The Strasbourg Statement. That altered everything. Now, I don't know whether His Holiness was acting on advice from Western lawyers. I, 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 I don't know for sure. Well, I suspect he, he was acting under advice. Um, but once he took that decision, it became much more difficult. To support a country that wants to be free is much easier than to support a country which says we want more freedom in the country where we are currently living. <clears throat> Do you understand? Mm -hmm. Yes. So as long as you could say sort of, you know, freedom for Tibetans, mm -hmm. um, that is a much better rallying call than say, mm -hmm. you know, human rights. We want to improve their human rights. Mm -hmm. So it became politically much more difficult mm -hmm. and it still is. I mean, it's much harder now to make any impression because people say, oh, but, you know, Tibetans are happy in China. They, they, they got autonomy. They haven't got autonomy. But, you know, people, people have been persuaded now that Tibetans no longer want to be free. Now, there are two other things I must point out here. The second thing is that um, under Deng Xiaoping, um, there was a sort of liberalisation took place, which is why Westerners were able to travel to Tibet, but also trade with the West increased. And China has become economically hugely more important. I mean, so many Western goods are now produced in China very cheaply. Sir Charles Bell, as long ago as the 1920s, predicted that the problem for Tibet would always be that the economic clout of China would outweigh the moral justice of the Tibetan cause. And that is very true now. You know, the economic clout means that no government, British, American, German, French, you name it, no one wants to upset the Chinese too much because the Chinese can punish them by cancelling contracts for aeroplanes or tanks or whatever it is. You know what I mean? They can just sort of make life difficult. Um, and there is a third point. I asked His Holiness about this on one occasion after he'd made his Strasbourg statement and I, exp I was trying to explain to him that it is more difficult now to campaign. And his answer was, and it's a perfectly good answer, he says, well, like, you know, you know we are not free. We do not have passports. But you are free. You have passports. You can speak for us. But it's not, it's not so easy. You can't. Actually, we can't speak for Tibetans. We can't say Tibetans really want independence if His Holiness has said we are happy to have autonomy within China. Do you so, understand? So when you were um, involved with Tibet Society yeah. and you were more yeah. Yeah. Um, politically active, yes. was it the time when you feel like it was easier to yes. do that? Yes. I mean, so all this 80s. was, I mean, I, 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 I ceased to be chairman in 1996. Mm. Uh, as long as that was going on, I mean, I, I, I tried to uh, campaign. I was writing off letters and so forth. I was doing what I could to keep the political situation in people's minds. And uh, I mean, the Tibet Society did invite His Holiness, along with some other organization, to the UK in 1996. And we had these big public talks and so forth. And we had you know, interviews on the radio and so forth. Um, after that, when I stepped down from being the chairman, I think the times changed also a bit, but there was perhaps less, um, perhaps the people who took over from me were not um, so politically willing to um, um, make a fuss. I'm not quite sure, really, but uh, at any rate, all I could say is that um, opportunities appear to have decreased. You know, It's very interesting you mentioned that because yeah. the time that we're talking about from the 80s, yeah. 83 yeah. till 89 to the yeah. Peace Prize, yeah. and then you were the chair until yeah. 96, mm -hmm. and then 
after 96, yep. actually Tibet became a lot more visible in the world. Yes. And yes. so many more people found out about the Tibetan yes. situation yes. in that time. That is right. But then that was the time where, in your assessment, it actually yeah. was after Strasbourg and after... Yeah. Campaigning. Yes. Campaigning. Campaigning. Yes was superseded by tourism. <laughs> I mean, it's an irony. I, see. Yes. I mean, you know, it, as I say, in the late 1970s, 78, end of the 1970s, Western people knew very little about Tibet. Because how could they know? that You couldn't travel there. Reporters couldn't go there. The only reporters who got to Tibet were communist sympathizers like Felix Green. Otherwise, you couldn't get there. So there was no news coming from Tibet. Now, in the 1980s, <clears throat> China opened up Tibet to tourism for the first time. And it did that because it was confident that it had got Tibet under control, that Western tourists could go there without there being riots and uh, problems. Western tourists, by this time, had got to know quite a bit more about Tibet. You know, they had been educated from the 1970s through the 1980s. They were educated, you know, people were writing for the newspapers, people like Jonathan Mirsky and John Gittings for The Guardian. They were becoming much more uh, educated themselves about Tibet. You know, they learnt a lot too. And their articles in the newspapers informed people about Tibet. And then there were things like, uh, uh, you know, disturbances and so forth, uprisings, and these got reported. Um, Western tourists were able to go, and the tourists who went were mostly interested in the religion. You know, they were people who were interested in Dharma. Um, and uh, they were satisfied to be interested in the religion. They were not necessarily politically very active. Um, but you're right, there is an mm -hmm. irony. Yes, interesting. Yeah. You know, that mm -hmm. uh, more people in the West visited Tibet for a certain period. It's now stopped again and it's a trickle again. But for a while, in the 1980s and 1990s, you know, there was a fair amount of tourism mm -hmm. to Tibet. Mm -hmm. um, but political campaigning has not really reflected this or taken off. Mm. Actually, no. I, did, I did want to ask you about your mm. own trips to Tibet yeah. because you started to yeah. go there in the yeah. late 80s yeah. and yeah. You, s you mentioned at the beginning that yeah. you had read Fosco Moreni's yes. Secret to Tibet. Sure. You'd read Seven sure. Years in Tibet, Henry yeah. Harrow. So yeah. how was it actually to travel to Tibet after such a long engagement through books? <laughs> Oh, like paradise. And then finally, <laughs> and finally, finally actually to like, be able to travel. For me, there. it was paradise. You know, this is what I've been waiting for all my life. When I, when I got to Tibet in 1988, you know, I'd been interested in 1952. That's what, 36 years. 36 years I'd waited to get to Tibet. You know, I'd been in Darjeeling. I'd met Tibetans. I finally got there in 1988. It was marvellous. I loved it. Um, I was very excited to be there. And, you know, I talk to people a lot and so forth. I, although it was forbidden, I gave out huge numbers of Dalai Lama photographs all over the place, <laughs> secretly, you know, when the Chinese weren't watching, but yes. you know. Um, and I took lots of photographs because I knew when I got back to the UK, I would want to go giving talks and so forth. And I took lots of photographs of the ruins and I can show you one or two here. I've got them if you want them later. Uh, <clears throat> but I was, I was impressed and in some ways, of course, slightly depressed by the amount of destruction. Because mm. when you went to Tibet in the 1980s, what you saw was a civilization which had been destroyed. I mean, you went to Gandan and I walked to Gandan on foot because I wanted to, it was a pilgrimage. I walked to Gandan, it took me six days on foot. And when you get there, it is as if it's been bombed. It is destroyed, you know, building after building was just, was just flattened on to the ground, you know. Of course, they've done some rebuilding since then, but um, everywhere you went, even the Yambu Lakang, of which you have a photograph here, the original one had been destroyed. What was there was a, a reconstruction. And you go to somewhere like Shigatse, you know, and you see the Shigatse Zong, which was at one time the second greatest uh, fought in Tibet. 
absolutely flattened. I mean, the scale of the destruction was, it was like, it was war, you know? Um, and that ought to fill visitors with indignation. But I think a lot of people who visit Tibet, they don't really understand it. They don't know what's going on. Uh, they need to be told. You know, you could say that a lot of education is still needed. You see, if you travel around Europe, Europe is full of ruined castles. But they were ruined about 1,500 years ago or 1,000 years ago. And people who go to Tibet, they see all these ruins of monasteries. I don't think a lot of them realise how recently they've been destroyed, that they've been destroyed within living memory. You know, within my lifetime, um, <clears throat> which is quite different. Um, so, I, I, I hugely enjoyed being in Tibet, um, and I, I, you know, if I could go back now, I'd, I'd go back. Um, Did you travel mostly to Lhasa, central Tibet? Every time I went to yes. Lhasa, mm -hmm. uh, and, but I always went walking as well. I always walking was always part of our trip. So we 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 we'd frequently go out to Tingri and walk out to Everest, the Everest base camps, and uh, uh, there were other places too we went, and you know, we'd hire yaks and go out and so forth, and um, there were various other places I went to as well, including up the, um, I mean, on one occasion we went, started at Chengdu, and we came all the way from Chengdu through um, Chamdo, uh, Dergei Chamdo, and uh, into Lhasa from the China, Chinese border, in fact. That was, again, a wonderful and exciting trip. What, um, one of the reassuring things about it, Tibet is that it is, it is in many ways a very empty country. You know, there are still, you can travel for mile after mile after mile, which hasn't changed all that much. What you notice is that the towns had become settled by Chinese incomers. But most of the countryside where the farmers and the nomads live, that is not much changed. You know, that is still much as it was. Um, yeah. Does that answer your question? Yes, roughly? absolutely. Yeah, no, um, I, was, I was very <laughs> interested because you had, <coughs> you had read a lot yeah. when you yeah. were very young. Yeah, yeah. Then yeah, you had yeah, had the experience yeah, yeah. in India. It was just as I expected. Oh, really? It was wonderful. Yes. I knew it was going to be empty, and I love that. Uh, I love that sense of enormous space, you know, that immense sense of space and silence, and not too many human beings, you know. It is, you know, if you look at the world religions, they spring up in places where it is easy to contemplate, in deserts. And, I mean, Tibet is really high-altitude desert. And it is... Tibet is ideal place for a religion because it is largely silent, it is largely empty. You're in contact with the world, the, the earth as it was made, if you like, not by human beings, but by the great creative force. So you're in contact with this, with wonder, you know, with, with something wonderful. Um, yeah. It, so how many times did you travel there? I went nine times. Nine times? Yes, nine times That's and uh, on, I was taking a tenth party when I was turned back. The Chinese um, refused me a visa. They, by this time they'd got wise to who I was. and After nine trips? <laughs> yes, they, they'd got wise. I mean, by this time they'd got computers. I see. As long as they had mm -hmm. no computers, yeah. I could get through. But by 1990, what, no, 2001 this was, they were computerised and they could bring up my name on their computers and say, ah, no. <laughs> <laughs> so I was banned. So your last trip was 1990? It was actually 2001. Oh, two, oh, so yeah, it's 2004. Been, I was taking, it was 2004 where I was turned back. I was taking a, a trip in 2004. And I arrived at Kathmandu. Everyone was allowed to go except me who was leading the trip. And uh, we, you have this group passport. And against my name, in letters two inches high, was cancelled. <laughs> <laughs> then I knew they didn't want me. <laughs> mm. oh, so you haven't been able to go back since no. then, or you haven't tried? Not so far. Not, not so, so far. far. <laughs> I, I do not give up hope. You know, I do not give up hope. 
absolutely. I, I, you know, although I am now quite old, I would still like to go back. <laughs> Great. Um, I wanted to ask you, you've talked a lot about your interest in Buddhism, yeah. Hinduism. Do mm -hmm. you still keep up that interest and would you call yourself a practicing Buddhist or have you been drawn to any other religions? No, no, no. Uh, Buddhism is the one that has influenced me most. Um, I'm not a great believer in labeling people. So, you know, if people say, have you converted to Buddhism? I say, no, no, no. It's not a matter of converting, you know. It's like Mahatma Gandhi, who said, you know, um, whether you're a Hindu or a Christian or a Buddhist, these things don't matter, you know. Um, whatever enlightenment is, you know, moksha, nirvana, enlightenment, I would compare it to the top of a hill or like Mount Everest, you know, and there are many ways up, you know, you can go from the north or the south or the east or the west, you can go up the Christian path or the Buddhist path or the Muslim path or the Taoist path, there are many ways to the top. And you don't have to sort of say, I'm this, that or the other. The important thing is that you practice something that will bring you nearer enlightenment. That is quite simple. I think, really. I mean, love of your fellow men is important, you know. Unselfishness is very important. Um, compassion. Um, I like the Buddhist term, behaving skillfully, you know. A skillful act is one which brings benefit to other people. Maximum benefit, you know. So, I would say I am, if you like, when I go to Tibet, I say, yes, I number you. You know, I am, I am, I am a Buddhist. Yes. You know, that is the way I think. But if people in the UK ask me if I'm a Buddhist, I say, well, I just say I've been influenced by Buddhism. Because, <laughs> you know, as soon as you say I am a Buddhist, mm -hmm. they put you in a category, you know, oh, you're that and I'm this, you know, we're separate. Right. right. It's like Catholics and Protestants, you know, it's Shias and Sunni Muslims. It's better not to say, it's just say, I say, it has influenced me a lot. But... Uh, I can tell you yes. that I am basically, I practice as a Buddhist, yes. Mm. So that's something that's influenced you your whole life? It has influenced my life very yes. much. Yes. It is very important influence, yes. 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 Incredible. And I, I, I do think um, that Buddhism is the greatest, the greatest cultural artifact that Tibet possesses. You know, it is hugely important. Now, you know, you and I know that Tibetan Buddhism has been heavily influenced by the Bun religion which preceded it. And it is a very interesting religion because, you know, um, many of the, um, the wrathful and peaceful deities and so forth are very different in the Mahayana tradition as the, from the Hinayana. And this is fascinating. It's fascinating and interesting, but it's not essential. I mean, the essential Buddhism can be practiced whether you're in Sri Lanka or Burma or Tibet or in the West. You know, essential Buddhism, you don't have to understand all these different um, deities and that is, not, that is not important, you know. They are peripheral, they are sort of, you know, less important. So you've mainly been self Self-taught. Self-taught. I would say, yes, uh, yes I mean, I, yeah. I've done it through reading. Mm -hmm. Yes, through you reading. You haven't followed right. any particular teacher? Or no, no, no. Mm -hmm. I haven't. No, mm -hmm. no. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether I should have done or not, but, you know, the way I've approached it has been to... I remember reading in 1952 in Christmas Humphreys, the Buddha only points the way. You yourself must walk the path. Now, that's critical. You have to do the work. You can't, no one else is going to get you to enlightenment. You've got to do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, it's through yeah. discipline, restraint, and understanding, you know. But I, I do think it's a religion of um, self-improvement, if you like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, all right, so I'm going to move on to something slightly different where I'm going to ask you to reflect about your time in the Tibet movement. So mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you if you can recall your your best moment or the moment that you remember with, you know, fun, a fun memory of your time with the Tibet movement? Gosh, that is quite hard. Um, obviously, um, <clears throat> I remember with some mild mini pride the fact that I, I did put forward the idea of His Holiness for the Nobel Peace Prize. 
I remember with huge joy um, my arrival in Halasa for the first time in 1988. That was really the culmination of a dream. That is what I had wanted to do. So arriving in Halasa at last in Tibet, seeing it for myself as a distinct from reading about it in books, that was hugely exciting. Um, that would certainly be a memorable moment. Obviously, meeting His Holiness, of course, is always memorable. And, you know, I do feel very privileged to have met him on a number of occasions, of course. Um, those are mm -hmm. key moments, I think. Yes, yes, yeah. some real highlights. But, um, I, I, you know, I enjoyed my time in Darjeeling very much, mm -hmm. too. And I am hugely grateful to the Pepper family, who were very good to me. Mm -hmm. um, and from whom I learned a lot, you know, and as I said in the article I wrote, I mean, it was Dr. Pemba, for instance, from whom I, I learned, you know, this Darwinian thing. When I used to sort of be upset at the way the Chinese had destroyed so much in Tibet, he would say, well, he'd say, you know, very philosophically, you know, he said, well, Darwin, you know what Darwin said, if it's of value, it will survive. If it's of no value, it won't survive. Mm. So, yes. you know, I, I learned that from him. And also, as I said in my article from Punta Wangyal, I, I, I learnt that instead of sort of constantly seeing the Chinese as the enemy, you've got to see them as your friends. You've got to, in a sense, convert them. You've got to remember the Chinese are also human. They're also your neighbours, particularly with the Tibetans. Mm -hmm. They're your neighbours. You've got to get them, in a sense, understanding your side. Mm -hmm. And you've got to trust their sense of justice ultimately. So. <laughs> <laughs> and then what would you say is your saddest moment or moments saddest? in relation to Tibet or your time with the Tibetan movement? I don't know that I, I would say any moments are sad. Mm. Um, um, I mean, I'm trying to think. Or maybe low, low points. Um, I think things like the Dorje Shugden controversy um, is very unfortunate. I think, um, I mean, the problem, you know, it is not only a Tibetan problem. All countries have traitors within their own community. You know, every country has got people who are opposed to the majority will in the country. And you can always stir up trouble. Now, the Chinese are very good at stirring up trouble within the Tibetan community. And it's easy to do that because the Chinese are rich. If you give a certain amount of money, whether it be to Ritting Monastery or to the Dorje Shugden movement, or to a communist magazine in Bombay, which is lampooning His Holiness in 1959, Blitz. Mm -hmm. yes. You know, if the communist government in China gives money, they can cause division within the Tibetan community. I think in 1996, when His Holiness came, I do remember writing an article on the Dorje Shugden movement and trying to explain it and it's quite difficult to explain, as you know. Mm -hmm. It's a very complex topic. But trying to explain this so that Western people could understand what was going on, you know. Um, but I think it is very sad that when His Holiness comes to the West to teach, there are some Tibetans and Western supporters who sort of are shouting down and saying the Dalai Lama is a fascist, that, you know, all that sort of rubbish. Mm -hmm. It is yes. rubbish. Yeah. Um, you know, we want human rights, you know, the, the, the Dalai Lama was stopping them. He is not. Yeah. Um, so the division within the Tibetan community mm -hmm. is, I think, sad. Mm -hmm. yes. And, you know, it is hugely important that Tibetans from the Tsukusum, whether they're sort of Amdos or Kambas or Utsangpas or whatever, that they are united. Whether they belong to this sect or that sect, they are united. Because, mm. I mean, Opportunities will come. At some time in the future, you know, Tibetans are going to have the chance to achieve independence again. I really think that will happen. 
and they've got to be united to do this, you know. Because if you're divided, you're weak, you know. Everyone knows that. In political circles, everyone knows that. If you divide a people, it weakens them. Mm. Even if you look at the politics in the UK at the moment, if you can divide the Conservative Party or the Labour Party, you weaken it. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, people are fighting one another. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's very true. <laughs> so that's, that, that, that's the saddest thing, yeah. is the yes. division within yeah. the Tibetans. Yes. <laughs> I think that's true. And also, any time you do have this kind of division, it yeah. makes the movement. Yeah. You know, weaker. Swami Vivekananda, very wise Hindu teacher, mm. he said, that which unites is good. Mm. That which divides is bad. Mm. And it's a great truth. Mm -hmm. Unity is good, division is bad. Mm -hmm. I think uh, I think that's a very good point to make with um, yes, with the Shogun movement yeah. and yeah. like you were saying, the um, Strasbourg proposal and the yes. sort of yes. giving up of independence that's has also right. led to it, this division, also so divides people, of yeah, course. This is yes. much uh, yes. causing the movement yes. to be weaker. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But His Holiness has been very good, mm. for instance, at uniting the different sects. Mm. You know, Kamapas, or, uh, Gulukpas, Nyingmapas, Mun. I mean, you know, as far as he's concerned, they're all, you know, he embraces them all. Yes. Um, I think unity is hugely important. Mm. Yeah. Um, well, I was going to ask you if you had any reflections on the current situ the situation when it comes to Tibet. I mean, you've already shared yeah. quite a lot. Yeah. If there's any sort of reflections you'd like to share about the current situation in Tibet? I mean, it's very difficult at the moment, I think. Um, it's very difficult. Um, His Holiness has withdrawn from the political sphere, leaving the Sikon. Um, he is now the sort of political figurehead, yes. um, though I think he is also circumscribed or limited in what he can do, you know. And uh, Tibetan people are always going to override him and still ask what the Dalai Lama thinks, what His Holiness thinks, you know. Um, there is, I think at the moment, an absence of leadership, of a direction, of knowing what, what Tibetans want. And, I, you know, I would come back to what I said about independence and uh, autonomy. It seems to me, until you can resolve that, I mean, the fact, I mean, it's, unless I'm wrong, I think what Tibetans really want is to be independent. I mean, unless I've been misinformed, I do not think the majority of Tibetans are happy living under Chinese rule. They do not have freedom. They do not have religious freedom. They cannot even choose the next Dalai Lama from their own people. They cannot choose the Panchen Lama without being countermanded and told that, no, you can't have him, you know. Um, Tibetans do not have freedom to um, educate their people through their own language. They do not have freedom within the monasteries in Tibet. Now, any sane person would say, people in that situation must want to be free. In that case, they must want to be independent. The Chinese, it seems to me, I mean, you know, the Chinese, we must treat them as friends, but the, as long as the Chinese are under communist control, and communist control believes in central control from the center, you know, it, it is very much centralized control, they are never going to allow freedom to the outlying areas, particularly to Tibet, Xinjiang, and the Mon Mongolia. I mean, those are the outlying areas which, where they have least right to be. Um, so they have to hold them down very hard. It seems to me, to be honest, and if you want me to be serious, that Tibetans have to say what we want is independence. What we want is our Dalai Lama to say, we want independence. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a big ask. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know you can't do it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in a way, I think the only way the Tibetan cause at the moment can be politically active is to say, look, we have tried since 1985, how long is that? 85, 95, 2000, 40 years. We have tried to work with the Chinese. We've tried to have dialogue. 
we cannot even, they will not even talk to us. You know, we, you remember all those talks that mm -hmm. went on? Yes. Nothing has been achieved. Nothing at all has been given. Now, that is a very good reason for saying, right, we have tried cooperation. We have tried the peaceful means. We've tried the third way and we have gained absolutely zero. We've got nothing for it. Given that we have achieved nothing, we must now say, look, we've tried to cooperate with the Chinese and it hasn't worked. We want to be free. Where do you, <laughs> where do you see the, the British role in uh, supporting Tibet? I mean, Britain has had a long history yeah. with Tibet. Don't count on any help. <laughs> <laughs> Don't count on your help. I wish I, it was otherwise, mm -hmm. but it isn't. Yes. There's no point saying it is. It's no point. People like Hugh Richardson, who are great supporters, are dead. You know, he's gone. People like Robert Ford. You know, people who knew Tibet before the Chinese came, they're all dead. Um, the current British government, the, the, not, not only just current, I mean, the British government <sighs> is going to not going to do anything which is politically impossible, you know. Right? The UK is not going to go to war over Tibet with China. We don't have sufficient economic clout to put sanctions on China. Remember that, you know, until about 1970 something, when Nixon went to China, the West was putting pressure on China. China was not a member of the United Nations. And, you know, we had some sanctions at the time. Now, we don't. Now we are enormously in debt to China because of all the cheap exports they send us. Realistically, no one is going to take up the cudgels on Tibet's behalf, you know. In the end, the Pressure has to come from within Tibet. If we have a saying in, in the UK, God helps those who help themselves. In other words, if you help yourself first, if you make an effort to rise up, God will help you. God helps those who first of all try to help themselves. You know, Tibetans first of all have to try and make their own. Uh, make their own determination as to what they want. If they did that, they would get support from the world. You know, most countries are sympathetic to Tibetans. Wherever you go, wherever I go, I find most people are sympathetic to Tibetans. You know, it's Australia, South Africa, they always think, poor old Tibet, you know, they're sympathetic. But unless there is something to be sympathetic to, you know, unless there is something to support, what can you do? The lead has to come from Tibetans. And you've got two leaders. You've got the His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Sikkim. You know, you've got to decide how, how are you going to create a cause which people can support? Westerners will support you if you are clear about what you want. That's my opinion. Thank you. <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, I've pretty much come to the end of my questions. I do have one last question. Yeah. Um, you've given a lot of your um, life to Tibet, to the Tibetan movement, mm -hmm. to supporting Tibetans, mm -hmm. even practically just when, they were, when Tibetans were newly refugees and then mm -hmm. you continued. Mm -hmm. but what would you say were the sort of, what kind of things has Tibetan sort of Tibet given you? Well, it's, I mean, it's quite hard to, to, to say that. Um, I mean, when I was in Darjeeling, I was considered an honorary Tibetan. <laughs> honorary too, because, you know, I, I, I used to eat samba, you know, drink, drink Tibetan tea. I mean, I feel, and, you know, even now, I'm over 80 now, you won't believe it, but if I go back to Tibet and I die there, I don't mind at all. You know, I, I don't mind if, I, if I'm sort of chopped up and my, I'm, I'm fed to, um, I have a sky burial and the, the um, vultures eat me. I mean, that's fine. In that sense, I consider myself sort of quite well integrated with Tibet. I, you know, a huge part of me is sympathetic 
to the Tibetan cause feels, you know, I am involved with Tibet, and who knows, my next incarnation, I may be born in Tibet for all I know. Maybe I will die there. I do not know. It doesn't matter. Um, but I mean, I do feel, um, apart from my British identity, my other identity would be Tibetan. I mean, I feel very um, closely um, involved with Tibet, both as a country and as a culture and uh, as a people. Um, so I don't know what more I can say, really. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they've given me a lot. And yes. I, I mean, I benefited a lot. I mean, I would say so spiritually, you know, mm -hmm. uh, spiritually yes. in terms of the wisdom and the understanding and whatever faults the Tibetan people have, and all nations have got faults, you know, we've all got flaws and faults, but I think, you know, Tibet has a lot of good things going for it, you know, there are a lot, there is a lot of wisdom and compassion and tolerance and um, I think Tibetan culture is something you should feel proud of. That's Thank all you. I can say. Thank you for that answer. Um, <laughs> I think there isn't much left for me to do except thank you for uh, this interview. It's been really interesting hearing about your lifelong connection with Tibet. Um, I'd like to offer you a kata. Oh, if that's very correct. kind of you. <laughs> <laughs> Everything very that you've done. Of you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, sorry, I've dropped something. There we are. Now, I'm, I'm not sure. Yes, I'm, that's very kind you of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you thank very you much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.